Before we get started, yeah. I just had a question for you. Oh, yeah, sure. Like, what's it like to be turning 37 years old? Why? Are you because screw I'm with asking me? you this question because it's your birthday uh, and oh, you're turning you 37. And so, happy oh, birthday to you. you. Uh, happy so birthday to you. Happy Thank birthday, you guys. dear Graham. Happy birthday to you. So, what, what should I uh, wish for that you uh, are able to successfully tolerate me in this interview? <laughs> no, I think you think big. Come on, think big. Yay! Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> you were a little reserved there in your singing, though. I'm not a good singer, and like, no? I'm on microphone this singing, but. Did you do karaoke night I'm terrible at karaoke. And like, Jay, Jay like, obviously can sing, because like, he was doing it on the stage last night. Yeah. But he, and he'll make me sing something just because it's so bad. Funny. I was talking to your uh, best friend Stacy the other day, and she uh, referred to you guys at, as real estate groupies. <laughs> yes. I'm curious <laughs> your thoughts. On um, that. You know, uh, that's how I grew up. My dad made his money in real estate and real estate development, and so I think it's in my blood. Mm -hmm. And so, if I wasn't working in sports, I would definitely be doing something in real estate. Like what you think? Um, you know, I don't know. I think probably development, you know, like, um, you know, especially like repurposing old buildings. It can add so much to, you know, your way of life, your community, you know, so I just, real estate is a passion, but it's a hobby. It's not something I do. I understand you like visiting houses on the weekends, going to these open houses, but not even in nice neighborhoods, necessarily. Here's the thing, <laughs> the way I look at it, I know like real estate agents by name. They're kind of like celebrities to me. Like, you know, I know which real estate agent has, you know, the bus bench that I drive by every day. And, you know, it's just, I, it's just a, a weird quirk that I have. How often are you on the apps? Um, all the time. Yeah. All the just for, as like just guilty for pleasure, fun. Yes, fun. absolutely. Okay, you own, I think, like three places in walking distance. Yeah. Of, what's the Raven's Den? The Raven's Den, oh, <laughs> I call it the guest house. I didn't know it had gotten the nickname Raven's Den. But it's, um, it's actually a place that I, I purchased during um, COVID. And I lent it to people who had to isolate because they had uh, the, uh, COVID and needed to be away from their family. So it's just a, it's a little one bedroom loft apartment. And you know, it's just kind of fun to have. And you aren't that big into traveling, right? You've been headed to the airport before on a trip and just literally changed your mind when you're driving there. I'm just not a good traveler. It's like it takes a toll on me. So, um, you know, and I, and I, you know, I, I just don't have that need to see everything. Like I know some people are like that. They have to like check it off their list and I don't have a list. I think that also speaks to how good a home life could be too. Like you're so happy and comfortable being at home, you know, watching TV with your dogs with the love of your life, it just, I think it speaks to like, no, this, this is vacation now. Like we, we now, we now are on vacation because we found each other and we can just relax and enjoy life. Last summer, I was obsessed because the Blues Brothers, you know, with Dan Aykroyd and Belushi uh, played at, um, the prison where they filmed the movie and they did a concert. And so not only did I have to go to it, I had to be a sponsor of it. Like I just, it was, you know, so like something like that for sure I would do, but that, that was like a unique experience. And what's the deal with you in movies? Well, movies, <laughs> like 
that's something that I did with my dad okay. every weekend. And my dad, because he was always working, and this was when I'm in high school, junior high, um, when he ha would have a day off to go see movies, he'd want to see three or four movies in a day. And so we would have a movie marathon. And so I, I, like movie theaters are very important to me because of that fond memory that I make sure I try to go to the movies every week to a movie theater to support um, that industry because I don't want it to go away. It's too important and I think it's kind of a, an event that people can do together and we're losing those things as people stay at home. And you won't just buy one ticket though. Explain oh, no. why. I, well, because I, I want to support the movie theater, and so I buy a bunch of tickets and I let everybody know, like, hey, I'm going to this movie this day at this time, and they always know I have tickets. So, like, um, if anybody wants to join, they're welcome to join. So from the time you were in elementary school, I think all you ever wanted to do was be in the family business. You said, I consider myself an ambitious person almost to my own detriment. Yeah. <laughs> How so? I just, I like to live up to the challenge, you know? So like, what am I capable of? If I saw somebody do something, then I'd be like, well, how would I accomplish that same goal? Like, I just, it's like, I guess, curiosity, you know, can, can I find that space in myself to, you know, do whatever it takes to get something done. And, and thankfully it wasn't to climb Mount Everest because that would never happen. <laughs> when you were a kid, you used to walk the hallways, pop into conference rooms. Uh, what sorts of things would you hear folks talk about with regards to the sports business? When I would walk into a conference room, it was usually because I was delivering donuts, right? And I was, you know, 14, 15, 16 years old, and my dad said, you know, go get us this or go get some coffee, whatever. And I would bring bring it in. And then instead of leaving, I would sit in the corner and I would listen and I would listen to the debates. And that when, you know, somebody wanted something over here, what were they willing to give up over there to get what they wanted? You know, like people pounding desks, like I, I really mean this, you know, and just like the theatrics of mm -hmm. negotiating and just being completely entertained by that. How do you think that impacted you? I, I just became fascinated with the business and wanted to know more and more. And my dad saw that interest in me and he fed it. Like he, you know, if there was uh, something that was coming up in business, especially when he was involved in um, world team tennis, he would give me a report or a brief and say, what do you think of this? Yeah. And he would ask my opinion. And you know, that, that was a powerful thing to be listened to. And you know, whether I influenced him or not, he could hear my thinking and how I approached whatever the issue was. And that helped you how? Um, I think it helped me just the idea that he had confidence in me, but I think it also helped him. And that meant everything. It too. meant yeah. everything. And, you know, I, I always emphasize to, to fathers to empower their daughters the same way um, because it, 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 it's just very important. I mean, both parents having them uh, listen to you. But my dad, you know, could... Um, hear my thought process and how I approached things and you know and you know he came to value that so that when things were on the line he knew how I would deal with the problem and that gave him more confidence to give me more authority and more responsibility. The time you spent running the forum, long hours, you were involved in a bitter labor dispute. What did that period teach you? When the job became available, my dad came to me and he said, I think you could do this job. And so as your boss, I'm offering you this job. But as your father, I'm advising you not to take it. And I didn't really understand that. 
until I got involved. And it was so time consuming because when you're running a venue, it, it allowed me to go from one side of the business, which I was the promoter, to the other side, which was running the venue and dealing with outside promoters and having them bring your, their shows to your venue. Um, it was valuable experience for me, but I was working, you know, 14 hour days and you, you have no social life. And so that, that was a very um, difficult time. But it, and it, it went it, on for how long? Um, about four years. And so, you know, I'd, I'd come out of a divorce and, um, you know, so I, I had the time, you know, but it wasn't a lot of fun. If you had to do that over again, would you still do it? Um, I got really burnt out. Um, I guess I, I had to, to go through to get me to where I am today. And it really paid off because when we moved the Lakers to a new arena in downtown LA, um, now we are, you know, the renter. And so understanding how the, the arena operated was really important in terms of negotiating our lease, not accepting no for an answer, because I know how things work. Um, so that, that was an important part of my career. You once said about your dad, he was concerned that I would sacrifice on a personal level a relationship and a family because of my ambition. Uh, your thoughts on that today? Um, you know, in some ways he was right. And, um, you know, I think he was always my father first instead of my boss. And uh, he didn't want to see me miss out on a big part of life, which was to have a family. And I did what was right for me. And of course, as a father, he would always worry about me. Well, and at the end of the day, you have created a massive family for yourself. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I think I think of uh, the Lakers as family, mm -hmm. and the fans are like family to me. Like, I like to sit at games with, you know, I don't sit in a suite. I love that that uh, people have access to me. I love taking pictures with fans and hugging them and hearing stories about who their favorite player is. You said you've gone from being like a sister to the players to a mother now. What was the kind of recognition of that change like? Um, just the, the age group, you know, when Magic came into the league, he was 19, I was 17 yeah. when my dad owned the team. So we were similar in age and then, um, as time went on, you know, now now I'm like literally the same age as their grandmothers. <laughs> and it's it's crazy. But um, I think really what changed and, you know, I, I talk about, you know, being on the other side of, you know, when I ran the forum and was on the venue side, uh, when I um, entered a relationship with the head coach, Phil Jackson, um, you know, I saw a whole different side of a basketball team. And really? Yeah, oh yeah, like, I mean, it was um, so different. And that's where I felt like I became more of the mother role uh, because he was kind of the father figure. You know, Phil would always call a practice on Thanksgiving and I would get so mad at him because these guys don't get enough time with their families during the season. And now you're, you're making them come in on Thanksgiving and have a practice. And he finally explained to me, he said, Jeannie, I'll have them home in plenty of time to have their Thanksgiving dinner. He said, but they need to understand this is their family as well. And a team really is like their extended family. And I really, uh, learn to appreciate that. How do you think Alana Kloss and Billie Jean King influenced you? Billie Jean King is a mentor to me. She's a friend, but I'll never forget the day being in my dad's office and he turned on the TV and he goes, you know, I want you to watch this. 
and it was the Billie Jean King versus Bobby Riggs tennis match. And he said, this is going to change the world because it was the battle of the sexes. It was, um, you know, great theater and great promotion. And I was honored to meet Billie Jean King. She's like one of those people that makes you believe that anything is possible. What did Jane Fonda teach you about a handshake? <laughs> Jane Fonda, I met her, um, you know, probably at like 14, 15 years old, and I was so in awe of her. I, I couldn't take my eyes off of her. And so, she, you know, she put out her hand for me to shake her hand, and I gave her a very weak handshake. And she pulled me aside, and she goes, I want you to remember this, that when you meet somebody, you make sure you, they remember you, and you give them a handshake, a strong handshake. Look them in the eye. And that was great advice, and I, I still do it to this day. So I think you're in the room with, like, eight-ish people uh, at some uh, meeting. There's a heated discussion. A man cusses. Uh, and what does he say to you, and how do you respond? <laughs> so uh, it was a, a heated negotiation. It was We were around a conference table, and, um, you know, I was... I was getting bullied in a way that is often ha times happens to a woman, meaning the guy, you know, used some four letter words. And when he did, he, he turned to me specifically and say, you know, no offense, you know, pardon my language. And it was literally the like tap on the head, little girl, you know, fragile. You know, I'm drawing attention to the fact you're the only woman in the room. And so I said, look, you know, if you're going to apologize to me, you apologize to everybody in this room. Like, in other words, you're not going to isolate me and make me feel less than anybody in this room. I'm an equal and I belong here. And, you know, I, I've, I've heard other women have the same kind of circumstance. It's really difficult to, um, you know, be the only woman in the room. And, you know, that was like 25 years ago. And now, you know, I'm not the only woman in the room. It, I don't stand out. And, it, and it, it's, it isn't something that people use against me like they did so many years ago. Because it was, I was, you know, uh, unusual or, a, you know, just kind of a, a prop or whatever, you know, I belonged in the room and they, they tried to take that away from me. And you felt like people uh, thought at the time you could be a, a oh, yeah, prop like, or something like that? Oh yeah, like, like uh, just, it could be because I was the boss's daughter, you know, that I was a woman, you know, whatever it was that they were just gonna be like, eh, you know, she'll get bored, she'll leave. She won't like it, you mm -hmm. know? We'll, we'll just like come at her hard, see what she's made of. And that's why you have to believe that you deserve your seat at the table. What was the situation where an NBA owner grabbed your butt <laughs> and like, what happened there? It's a, a, about the bullying and about the, you know, intimidation. And so as we were waiting, taking a break from the meeting, and everybody's in line for the buffet for lunch during the lunch break, you know, somebody grabs my ass. And I turn around and, you know, I was so shocked. But it was like, you know, again, um, if, if I didn't have uh, the confidence that my dad put in me, that was a moment where I wanted to shrink and to be nothing, that I would have, you know, gotten sick and said, I got to go. Do I really belong here? You know, I'm just really, you know, you know, not one of the group. Like, you know, I'm being singled out mm -hmm. and made me really self-conscious. So what did you end up doing? I, I just gave him a dirty look, like back off. Yeah. And I stayed in the room and I, and I realized that I might not be able to gain the respect of the existing ownership groups, 
but everybody that came after me, I could help help them in the room because they'd be new, they'd be the new person. So the, the next new person was Mark Cuban. And I made sure that, you know, from day one, I put my hand out to him and said like, hey, if I can help you understand any of this stuff, if there's any questions, like, here's my number, like, call me, you know, and I'll help you and I'll support you. Playboy. <laughs> um, how true Doesn't even <laughs> exist anymore, Playboy magazine. <laughs> um, how true is it that uh, you were the kid in gym class who got dressed in the stall? I was very, very shy. I still am very shy, and that's probably why I'm a terrible public speaker. I am a terrible poker player, because I blush and turn red. I would not be able to bluff mm -hmm. very well. And so Playboy was one of those things that um, you were insecure about your appearance for a period of time, yes, right? Yes, yes. And, and so appearing in Playboy was, you know, something that was a, a challenge to myself. And when I, when I um, posed, I was, you know, 32, 33 years old. Yeah. So it wasn't like I was making a rash decision and that I, I really didn't know who I was. This was something that, if that's something that I could accomplish, that would be, you know, a, a personal dream of mine. And you was on the heels of a divorce. And hey, correct me if I'm wrong, you, you contacted the magazine and yeah. pitched yourself. You have to go through a test photo shoot. And so when they came back and said it was a go, um, I didn't tell my dad that I was doing it until it was done. In a weird way, he directly impacted your interest in it, right? Yeah, I mean, my dad at one point owned, a, you know, these, your, your viewers probably have never heard this, but there used to be uh, the Playboy Clubs, and my dad owned a Playboy Club in Phoenix, Arizona, and my Aunt Susan, his sister was a bunny. And so even Linda, your longtime oh yeah, advisor, yeah, worked Linda at the was a Playboy yes. club in Chicago, I think, right? Yeah, Linda yeah. was a bunny. And there was a club in Century City. Hugh Hefner was a friend of my dad, so I met him. So like Playboy was, you know, kind of just part of the landscape that I grew up around. So I never thought of it as anything negative. It was always about celebrating women and um, you know but I just didn't think that I would you know have the nerve to do it nor would I be um, you know considered beautiful enough to be in the magazine. What'd your dad say when you finally he, told him? He had a he had a really good quote he said um, it will be the first issue of Playboy magazine I haven't read. So therefore, he's, he's endorsing the magazine, mm -hmm. that he reads the magazine, but I'm still his daughter. Mm -hmm. And so he thought it was great that I was pursuing something that I you know, was interested in. And I spoke to Jimmy Connor's wife, Patty McGuire. She was Playmate of the Year in, I think, 1976 or 77. And um, I asked her about the experience before I ever you know, pursued it, and she said, you know, it's it's a great experience, and she goes, but always be prepared wherever you are, somebody's gonna approach you with the magazine to sign it. Like, you, you when you least expect it, mm -hmm. like the pictures never go away. And so now this is the early 90s, really before the internet <laughs> takes off, and so like, Never dawned on me that 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 you know these pictures would have a life on the internet of their own and will always be out there. And you know when you when you pose, you you accept that that's you know part of the the program. Except the internet has made it that I literally you know probably. Um, receive, you know, five to 10 requests a week where people have, you know, printed the pictures and asked me to sign them. Really? And, you know, they send a, you know, a postage paid envelope for me to send it back. And I always sign them because I'm not, 
I don't regret taking the pictures. It's a little bit like, wow, like it, it really doesn't ever go away. But, um, you know, the idea that, you know, um, the pictures are kind of legendary. <laughs> so, so. so you had said, uh, had I decided not to do Playboy because others didn't approve, that would haunt me. Yeah, and and that's what I had. Literally had somebody who I admired and respected say to me, you know, um, how is this going to help you get to where you want to go? And I thought, wow, like he clearly disapproves or is judging me for making this decision. And if I would have said, okay, stop the process, I don't want to do it because of something that he, you know, thought wasn't a good idea, I really would have been regretful that I allowed other people to dictate to me what would make me happy. What do you think you learned about yourself going through your first marriage? Um, you know, like marriage is humbling. Um, that nobody gets married to end up in a divorce. And um, it was um, disheartening to, to go through a divorce. And I realized I, at that time, I didn't make the marriage my priority. That my husband at the time, Steve Timmons, was a world-class volleyball player, Olympic gold medalist and uh, signed a big deal to play professional indoor volleyball in Italy. And I was trying to, um, you know, commute back and forth between LA and Italy and be supportive of him and his career without losing my career. And um, it was unsatisfying because I couldn't, you know, be there for him for the marriage. I couldn't do my job the way I wanted to. And, um, you know, it eventually failed. Explain who Jeannie Dangerous. Uh, <laughs> Jeannie Dangerous was my uh, nickname. Uh, Jeannie like, Dangerous. That's like, well, when I was single, my girlfriends called me Jeannie Dangerous because it was like, you know, as serious as I was about work, I was serious um, about having fun. OK, so we, we have a question uh, for you. OK. <laughs> hey, Jeannie, it's your old friend, John McEnroe here. And I got a question for you. Remember it back in the old days, you were a big promoter for tennis at the forum, promoting matches with the likes of yours truly, Jimmy Connors, Andre Agassi, among others. Now you run the Lakers and own that team. My question is this, is that a step up or down for you? <laughs> See you soon. <laughs> it's the best. You guys dated after uh, the, each of your divorces, right? Yes. Yeah. It's like when you're both on the rebound, it's kind of like you you find your, you commiserate with a person. And, and I'd known John for a long time. And, I, you know, there's something really adorable about him, even though he was, you know, Sometimes people would get frustrated with him in terms of his tennis and his behavior. I always saw like the heart in in John. And anyway, you know, and we made a lot of money promoting tennis events for him. And so I guess to answer John, uh, running the Lakers is <laughs> it, it, like if I didn't have the experience with you, John, I don't know if I could have dealt with some of the personalities that I've had to deal with in uh, in the NBA. But you gave me uh, really good practice. How about the best Dennis Rodman dating story? Uh, you know, like that. I did not date Dennis Rodman. I did. He, he became a member of the Lakers. Um, because he came out and said that. Yeah, he, he I mean, dated. yes, yeah. I guess. In other words, when my dad brought on Dennis Rodman to the team, yeah. it was kind of like, let's make sure that we know where he is at all times. So like if it's if it's about, you know, hey, where where are you going to be tonight? OK, 
we're all going to this restaurant or we're going to this club or we're going to this beach or we're going to wherever Dennis is going to be. You could say it was dating to say, say that it was, you know, making sure that I had an eye on him. So we obviously spent time with you and uh, Jay yesterday. So explain the living situation set up. Okay, everybody is going to want to live exactly the same way. It does sound kind of amazing. <laughs> right now we live in a, a building that has three units. So I live on the top floor and Jay lives on the first floor. And so there's, you know, a couple that live <laughs> in between us. So we're, we live together, we're at the same address except I'm unit three and he's unit one. We don't really want to change anything because, you know, I like my space and I have my schedule and he likes his space and he has his schedule. But we're, you know, I can, you know, take the elevator down in my slippers and, you know, hang out a little bit and go back up. And I would recommend it to any couple that feels the same way. It's like, all right, I'm going to go upstairs. Like, OK. I mean, we see each other every morning, every afternoon, and every night. When you're home alone in your bed, it's like, the guys are gross. <laughs> like, we just make sounds. Like, we sweat. The, sh the sheets get all wrinkly and weird. It's like, oh, just let her sleep like a princess or a Barbie still in the box. Like, there's no, she doesn't need to be subjected to me in my, like, wrestling sweatpants. Just belching in my, like, you know. What made you realize the relationship was serious? There was just something about him when I first met him that drew me to him. And even with all our ups and downs, I could always see his heart and who he was. So I, you know, just fell in love. It's kind of the greatest thing that ever happened to me. You know, I, I remember when we met, I had a sports talk radio show at the time and I interviewed her and I completely, over the phone, and I completely imagined that there was a vibe, like just complete narcissist run amok. I was like, oh, this is totally a thing. So then I went and I DM'd her on Twitter and I said, you know, I have a podcast. It'd be great if you came on the podcast and she agreed to do my podcast. But I wasn't prepared for falling in love the moment I saw her. Like, I remember her coming off the elevator. It was a green elevator, palm tree carpet, because I was staying at a hotel at the time, and I, it was slow motion, just, whoa. Very unexpected. And what was it that really hit you? I mean, the fact that she can walk in slow motion, I thought that was pretty <laughs> odd. I didn't know I wanted someone like that in my life, my entire life, until that person walked into my life. And then when they walk into your life, everything, every struggle, every argument prior to, with anyone else and every battle and every heartbreak, it just none of it matters. None of it makes sense. And you just you just want to start this life right away. So I just didn't let her out of my sight from that moment on. Our next comedian, you know, from Saturday Night Live and uh, Sharon McGuire. Let's get something out of the way. You guys, you guys don't look the same either, okay? <laughs> What's it like watching this guy on stage, Jeannie? Oh, I, I'm, I'm just so um, amazed at how smooth he is. And, and some nights, it's almost like he's walking on water. Like, his set will just be... Like, he, he doesn't even have to take a breath. The audience has to take a breath. But he just keeps, like, right on that level. It's, it's really uh, phenomenal. You're very sweet. It's weird, though, because it's not, it's not a skill set. It's a, it's a presence. Because I'm on stage having, like, a complete dialogue with myself. And really? Like, like, I never hear nothing. I'm like, it's, there's always somebody's just going, repeating a punchline back, or a waitress saying, excuse me, or the ice machine's clacking and you know, flopping and whatever. But it, it's, it's always a cacophony, like a carnival of sounds. And it's just my job to just throw it all into one net and just manage it. I, I, I say like it's, it's like throwing a net in the ocean. There's 
there's 300 people in the audience. You just got to hold all 300, and then after an hour goes by, you're like, ah, now you can go. <laughs> These Bigfoot assholes, they just, and if you're out there, you need to just stop and stop trying to believe that Bigfoot is real. I, you guys are idiots, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've seen seahorses a mile under the sea in the Marianas Trench, a male seahorse explode babies out of its belly, a man giving birth to baby seahorses underwater. But you can't get me a video of like an 11 foot Great Dane walking on its hind legs, knocking over garbage cans. I'm just, I'm such a fan of his and I'm a fan of stand up because I think stand up is like the most fearless thing that you can do. That it's like there is no, nothing pr to hide behind, nothing to protect you from the audience. It's just, it's going up there and burying your soul and bringing people in. And um, I think that's what's powerful about comedy and that it's so useful in our society to help us move past things that are challenging and that might be uncomfortable to talk about. And you uh, took uh, comedy classes on a couple yes. of occasions. I think you went to two classes and you quit, but then you came back a number of years later and did it again. Uh, w what was the benefit you found in that? Um, you know, I, I get asked to speak publicly a lot and I'm a terrible public speaker. I get extreme, oh, I, I, I am, I'm, I get extremely self-conscious. I have stage fright and um, I was talking to um, someone and they they recommended this class it's called pretty funny women and uh it it helped me a lot and you know i would recommend it to anybody and you know how how often can you be at my age where you can learn something new and challenge yourself and and you know, come out on the other side. What was it like for you uh, watching her open for you? I was terrified. <laughs> Were you? Yeah, because if she stinks, it's like, oh no. And then she was great. And somebody, you know what happened is somebody gave her a, a giant bouquet of roses. Mm -hmm. And so she did her whole set holding this giant bouquet of roses and she had lived like, that she was Miss Pasadena. And it was just, it all worked. And I was like, you should just always do like comedy or public speaking holding a giant bouquet of roses. It looks appropriate with you. Right, it could be my thing. He's obviously been very open about his addiction. I was listening to him on one show. I mean, he was talking about how he was snorting Adderall, th that sort of stuff. What was the, the lowest point and how did you guys get through it together? Um, you know, when he talks about like, snorting Adderall and all that, like, I had no idea. You know, he was an excellent liar. He could, you know, um, deceive and manipulate situations. Like how so? Um, you know, if I called him out on something, like you were late for this, or, you know, you lost that opportunity because you had erratic behavior on the set, he could always find someone else to blame. You know, it was never his fault. He wouldn't take accountability. And it got to like a breaking point where, you know, it was, it, you and know. And what was that for you guys? His erratic behavior. It just, it was, you know, he, in one week, I think he ran out of gas three times in his car. You know, and, and it's like, how, how is that possible that you run out of gas? Like, what are you paying attention to? Like, what, you know, it just, it, 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 things just weren't right. And so then I had confronted him and I said, I just don't believe your lies. And so you don't even need to bother me with them anymore because I don't believe them. And I, you know, I tried to date other people and just, you know, end the relationship and, you know, but I, I was never gonna end the relationship with his son. You know, I'd grown attached to him and, um, you know, and I worried about him. So finally just having conversations, I'd never talked to his agent. Like he never even introduced me to his agent. He would say, well, don't talk to my assistant. You know, he kept all of us at a distance. So that we yeah, yeah. Intentionally, so that we couldn't compare notes. And finally, like we all realized we were seeing the same thing. 
and that you know all the his job opportunities were drying up because he was burning bridges wherever he was going um, you know by not showing up on time getting on fights with people on the set or in the club so finally the decision was made to to do an intervention and it was very distressing for me because I didn't know if this would be the, the thing that he would never speak to me again. But I knew it, ha it, it, it was time, like we had nowhere else to go. And you're thinking what that, that, that morning? That he's gonna, he's gonna, you know, he, he could fight all of us, <laughs> he could punch all of us. You gotta understand, Graham, to be 50 years old at your own intervention is, mm -hmm. It's humiliating. It is, that's why I guess the reaction of so many drug addicts is anger, because it's such a defense to go like, no, you're all out of line. But at 50, I kept so many secrets. I kept the fact that I wanted to get well a secret too. His life had become unmanageable. And you know, he, he knew he was gonna die if he didn't get help. It's a dead end street. Like there's nowhere to go, addiction, will kill you. When you actually can be beaten down to your knees by your addiction, where the only conceivable way out is what you're being offered, and then you take it. My way led me into an intervention at 50 and going into rehab and standing in line for meds in pajamas at 50 years old. Like that's, I have, I have empirical data that my way does not work. So when you surrender, surrender, like, absolutely I'll do whatever it takes and you do that and then you build slowly by slowly by slowly one day at a time and you learn a design for living to share that with somebody is re is it's like winning the Super Bowl the NBA championship and the World Series all wrapped in one because it's not a game it's your life why not run and say you know the, the hell with this because I think Every person at some point in their life needs help or support. It seems like there was a dozen exits that she could have taken for a much easier few years. I guess she loved me until I could love myself. Like I get choked up even thinking about it, like how, how at my worst she's seen me and stuck with me. You know like in a cartoon where like there's a, a sheep dog that's gonna walk off a construction site but then the last second a beam comes up and saves it. Mm -hmm. Well, it was like the opposite for me. She met me right as I missed the beam and went down into my bottom. When somebody sticks with you through something like that, that's, that's some paint you don't want coming off your canvas. What's it like for you listening to him tell those stories, having kind of lived it firsthand? The first time I saw him do that, kind of go into that vein about the intervention, it was too sensitive. And I was like, is he, is he trying to like pay me back by, by like talking about it on stage and I'm uncomfortable, but then like. And it touches you kind of now oh, even talking yeah. about it. And, but then and I realized like how much that's helping people, that he's so vulnerable and that he is making people laugh through it. But it was the scariest event of my life. And then to see him embrace it and find the humor in it was so powerful and humbling. And I, I couldn't be more proud when he, you know, he just, Nobody talks like that. It's really, it's, it's so important. You have to lie to get a drug addict to their own intervention. Hey, buddy. Like, you can't outthink a drug addict. You gotta come up with some scheme to get us to sit still. Here's what they told me. I had a podcast at the time, and I was told the next morning at 8 a.m. for my podcast, I was gonna interview Wu-Tang Clan. <laughs> And I was so high, I believed them. Seinfeld says you're either above them or below them. You can't vacillate. So that entire story is, oh, I was beneath below you. <laughs> so it gives me a lot of freedom. I'm the reason for all my problems, which was really liberating too, because if I'm the reason 
for all my problems, and that means I always have a solution. I know it's hard to talk about, but it has to feel so gratifying to have gone through it and then come out on the other side in the way you guys have. It, I mean, it is, but like you, you never really ever come out of it. You always like it, you take it one day at a time, and you're yeah. grateful for that day. But like when when he talks about angry packing, I can't believe that he could make it funny because it was so awful that moment because he's staring at me like I'm gonna hate you the rest of your life for doing this to me, and he's packing as and I and I'm I'm like melting inside, but I've got to stay strong and. The fact that he can go up there and get a room full of people to laugh, and then it's like, oh my gosh, like nothing is so scary that you can't find your way out of it or using humor to like help you see it for what it is. What was the moment you realized you were kind of validated in the decision that you made and you could kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel? Oh, um, it, like every day it's like something, it's, an, it's another new thing that happens. So like, you know, when he came back from rehab and, and we heard a song that we liked and he just grabbed me and we started dancing in the kitchen. Like, and that the joy, the freedom that he had of just, you know, like being in love and like being on the other side of it. I'll show you my before photo. My intake photo. Yeah. Oh, it's soulless. But you just stay each day. Like, you just keep getting happier and happier. And as you go, my thing is I put, I put as many people between me and my and it's really hard for me to get to my Like she said, compared notes, and she wasn't, she wasn't the person that did it, it was my agent, and she got brought in, so I think that was validating, like that you were brought in, not like having to lead the charge. I was prepared if, if it hadn't gone well that I was gonna move out and not tell him where I was. Like that, you know, I was, you know, like, that was the best I could do in terms of cutting ties. <laughs> well, I knew it worked too. Like my mom got sober when I was ten, so I was like, just, just you need somebody else to pull the emergency brake. I think they give you Seroquel so you don't run out of rehab. <laughs> you're having a tantrum, you take your pill, you're like, you know what, f this place, and f you, I'm out of here. <laughs> the driveway. <laughs> Your parents got divorced. What do you remember from that period of time? Because that had a big in impact on you back then. Yeah, I mean, back then, you know, this was like the late 60s, early 70s. Um, parents, for whatever reason, believed you never told your kids anything you never gave them the sad news. You just kind of left them in the dark. And I realized like that was the worst thing that you could do because, um, you know, as they were going through the process of separating, my dad would only come home on the weekends. So during the week, if I was over at my friend Megan's house and her dad was home, I'd say, well, why is your dad home? You know, is, why isn't he at the office? Because when I'd ask my mom, where's dad? She'd say, he's at the office. Mm. And so I thought all dads were at the office during the week and only came home on weekends yeah. and nobody ever explained it. And so it got to the point, you know, of you know, my sixth grade graduation and my dad's not there. And, all my friends are asking me, where is he? And I don't have any answers. Like I just said, oh, he died, you know? And it was, it was m the only way I could get them to stop asking me the question because I couldn't say, I don't know where mm -hmm. he is. That made you feel how at the time? Yeah, it made me feel abandoned. And, you know, it, it, it put a sense of um, 
loneliness and fear and being isolated, you know, and feeling different than everybody else who had their dad there. Be because your brother Johnny did once said, I could never understand why he'd want to go to Las Vegas with a Playmate of the Year rather than take us to Disneyland. I guess I felt the same way. And then as, you know, then as their relationship ended and they went their separate ways, then that's when I got to have more time with my dad. It's when I was like, you know, 14, 15 mm -hmm. years old, you know, then I was meeting, you know, his new girlfriend, whoever that was at the time. And um, I got to spend much more time with him during the summer. During the winter, he would take us to USC football games and different events. So everything that I did with him was always around sports or movies. That's, that's kind of what we did. I wanted to ask you about your mom because she obviously is a bit of an unsung hero, doesn't get near as much attention. But the role she played in your life is what? I guess that's where I get like the the softer, sweeter side. My mom was, you know, just this beautiful, um, sweet. Um, she just was always very giving and very lovable. And um, I think, you know, she wanted her family together and she was heartbroken by the marriage ending. And um, I don't think she ever really recovered from that heartbreak. Really? And, you know, it was, it was hard on her. And, um, you know, I miss both my parents, but I, I think people tell me I remind them of my mother, and that's a really nice compliment. How did you find out you had another sibling? Um, you know, right after my um, dad passed away, um, in 2013, my mom called me, and she was at the be beginning of, you know, of her dementia. She told me the story about when they were first married that they had given up a child for adoption. And um, she said that they gave away the child because she was a girl. And so, like, okay, that doesn't make sense. I go, well, if you gave her away because she was a girl, why did you keep me? Yeah. And she goes, I don't know. I'm like, okay, well, like, why are you telling me? Do you want me to go find her? And she goes, no, I just, you know, I just needed you to know. So I realized that this was something that my dad had told her, you know, to keep from us kids, like, that that she waited until he had passed away because he's the only other person I could ask to verify. I asked a lot of his, you know, former coworkers, his former secretary, do you know anything about this child? And and the, they didn't know anything about her. They'd never heard of it. Somebody said, well, you know, your mom's probably just confused. She probably saw a movie or something. And she's, so I didn't think anything about it. And then, Five or six years later, I get a letter, a certified letter, explaining, you know, from this person who says, I think I am related. And um, through the Freedom of Information Act in California, she was able to get her adoption papers. So I looked at the adoption papers, and it's exactly what my mom told me. You're thinking what? At I'm the thinking, time? like, this is her. You know, I have a sister. And, you know, I, I, I said to somebody, I go, I went from being Marsha Brady to Jan Brady in like <laughs> one day, you know, I'm now I'm the middle daughter. But on the adoption papers, I could see these were my parents' signatures. And, you know, I was like, this is, this can't be a coincidence. And um, she had gone on Ancestry, and I'm not on Ancestry, um, and she connected with an aunt. And, you know, because she had always looked for her birth parents. She mm -hmm. knew she was adopted. And so 
sure enough, this was it. And so I, you know, took the letter. I, it, it came right before Christmas. You know, at this time, my mom, you know, is still, you know, living, but she's, you know, like she gets very confused. And so um, I let all my siblings know and um, I wanted to put my mom with her because my mom had searched for her uh, her entire life and um, missed her. And when my mom told me the story, she said in her mind, she had named her Marie. And that's my middle name. So I knew, like, you know, I just always had a feeling this story had some level of truth to it. And, um, you know, so I wanted to take Marie to meet her mother and for my mom to be reunited with the baby that she had given up. How amazing did it feel to be in a position to be able to do that? It was amazing, but you have to understand like the timeline of what was going on with the team at that time. So, you know, uh, the team was struggling and my mom was living in Las Vegas. And so I couldn't get the time to take Marie to meet her mother. And, um, you know, finally, you know, and as people will remember, um, Magic decided to leave his job as head of basketball for the Lakers. So gave you a lot of notice. Didn't give me any <laughs> notice. I heard before, uh, you know, I was one of the last ones to know. And I said to Linda, I go, this is, this is becoming so complicated. How am I ever going to get I, I need to make this happen with my mom and Marie. And Linda said, let's just go. Let's just drop everything, you know, take, you know, 48 hours and just, we'll go to Vegas and we'll meet Marie and we'll put them together. And that I think was one of the greatest moments of my life was to be able to give that to my mom and that she knew who she was and that, um, you know, I got to meet this sister who looks amazingly like my mother, and I felt like I'd known her my whole life because so many of her mannerisms are familiar. Really? Even though we have no common ground about who we know or anything like that, there just was this familiarity. And, um, you know, uh, my mom passed, you know, um, about eight months after that. So I'm, I'm really glad that I was able to accomplish that. How tough of an upbringing did your dad have? Um, my dad came from very humble beginnings. Wyoming, right? Yeah, Wyoming. His mother was a single mother. This is like the depression, coming out of the depression, you know, so she would work a job during the day and then she would, you know, at night, go on dates, you know, she was looking to get married. And um, she would leave my dad home alone and you know, lock him in, he was like a latchkey kid. And um, you know, he would wake up and be terrified, you know, cause he couldn't find his mom. And you know, he, he talked about those, those times in his life. He was very vulnerable and fragile. Um, and you know, she remarried and her new husband wouldn't adopt my dad. He had the last name Buss in a family with the last name Brown. And then they went on to have two more kids. So he, you know, he always felt left out because he wasn't, um, you know, he wasn't part of the family. And that exclusion, you know, um, that, that pain made him who he was because he never wanted people to feel excluded. And that's why it was really important to him about um, Laker games. He wanted everybody to be a Laker fan. Nobody would be excluded from being a fan of his team. 
And you were talking about the poker lessons he gave you. I, I think this plays into it, but it was him and a colleague, they were aerospace engineers, mm -hmm. put aside $83.33 from their monthly payments until they accumulated $1,000. Mm -hmm. uh, take it from there. And then they bought uh, their first apartment building. And um, they did all the, the, the handyman work themselves, rented out the units, and created positive cash flow. And then my dad, having the mathematical mind, knew, well, if I can do this with one, let's multiply it. And so that's when they started to amass this real estate empire, and certainly real estate in Southern California in the 60s and 70s. You know, there was a population boom, and, um, you know, he made a lot of money. At the time when he decided to buy the Lakers, what did people think of the deal he did with Jack Kent Cooke? It was one of those things that he, he spent two years trying to convince Jack Kent Cooke to sell him the team. And Cooke, at the time, was living in Nevada because he was going through what ended up being, at that time, the largest divorce settlement in history. But he, he moved to Nevada to become a resident of that state in order to try to get around some of the, the uh, community property. And um, so he wasn't attending Laker games. Mm -hmm. And so my dad would fly to Vegas and meet with him and, you know, continue to work on him to get him to sell the team. Because my dad saw this undervalued asset that wasn't being paid attention and that he knew that if he could get control of that asset, that he could bring more value to it. And, uh, you know, eventually did, but it was, it was a very complicated transaction where they literally, you know, were trading land. And at, at one point, you know, Cook wanted the Chrysler building. And so my dad somehow, you know, got that through different real estate transactions, and he owned the Chrysler building for about five minutes. And, you know, he loved to tell that story. Um, but, you know, here he, he comes in, and his reputation, you know, he, he owned a Playboy club, you know, he loved to play pool, loved to play cards. And, um, you know, the old guard at the league office were kind of like, you know, who is this guy? You know, he's kind of brash. And is he going to come in and ruin the league? And, um, you know, so he almost didn't get approved. The impact uh, you think he's had on the NBA would be what? Um, I think, you know, he was somebody that, um, you know, really thought about the marketing and the merchandising. And so, you know, he was the one that brought in the Laker girls, you know, that had never been done before. He liked having um, what we call the Laker band, but it was really made up of USC and UCLA band members. He liked that college atmosphere, that it was, you know, that it was a constant, um, you know, something going on. When the Laker girls came out, you know, it was, it was the ultimate in, you know, um, giving each gender the stage, right? So the men had the stage. When they took the break, the women got center stage. And so, um, you know, it was about, you know, shining a light on great talent, having entertainment. And, you know, the, nobody had really thought of the NBA like that before. The timing was good and, you know, the, the uh, passion for giving Los Angeles a team that they could be proud of uh, was really important to him. And so the investment and the passion and the, just the, the brilliance of Jerry Buss really created an asset. Why did your dad decide to give Magic 5% of the team upon his retirement? Um, he had years left on his um, contract. And of course, we all know when Magic first retired, um, it was because of uh, HIV. 
And so instead of my dad paying off that contract, he gave him a piece of the team so that he would always be part of the team no matter what. How true is it that your dad was telling Magic that you know he wanted you and Magic to one day run the team all the while, uh, telling Jim, your brother, he wanted you and Jim to run the team? Magic wanted to learn everything about business from my dad, mm -hmm. so he mentored Magic, and that relationship in the 80s was, you know, you'd never seen anything like it um, in in sports before that. Men of really two different backgrounds and ages, um, really coming together to form a partnership and feel the same way about what they wanted to accomplish. You know, and I talk about that's like the winning formula in sports. Um, and at that time, Jimmy was, wanted to be a horse trainer. And so, you know, he didn't see his sons as being interested in the family business, whereas he knew- Because from, they weren't at the they, time. They yeah. weren't, you know, Johnny, um, he's done a lot of different things. Johnny's very talented. Jimmy really loved the horses. And so, you know, that's, that's where he started laying his plan, like magic, I want you to, to uh, run the basketball. But, you know, my dad knew that, you know, he probably was gonna do bigger things than just you know, run basketball with the Lakers. Tell about the emotional call that you get one day from Magic telling you that he had sold his stake. It was disappointing. Um, it, it affects you now even thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I mean, it, it, it's like, I, he did very well for himself, yeah. don't get me wrong, but like, you know, the value has only gone up and you know you can see you know he's he's an investor with the Dodgers and now he's with the the Washington football team you know and he should have a piece of this team but i think it was hard for him to see the lakers struggle after my dad passed and um we did struggle and then kobe retired and it just got worse and worse. When Magic resigned, he does it in the media, yeah. uh, and that's after a three-hour meeting the two of you had had the night before. You knew nothing of his plans, yet your first public remarks after that are still overwhelmingly positive. Oh, yeah. Um, how, in a situation like that, do you have the capacity to be so kind? Um, because I saw the same thing happen before when um, he, in 1982, he asked to be traded from the Lakers because he wasn't happy with the system that Paul West had wanted to run. He took the ball out of his hands. He couldn't play with the joy that he'd grown accustomed. And so my dad was like, wait, 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 like, wait, let's talk this through. We're not gonna make that decision now. Um, so I know that magic, if something's bothering him, he doesn't hold it inside. He lets, he lets you know. And I, I can see now that this wasn't the right job for him. You know, it requires a lot of time away from your family. And he'd earned a place where he could take some time and be on a yacht and, and enjoy his summertime when we're all dealing with free agency. But I know if I pick up the phone and I say, I need you, he's there. Mm -hmm. he's, he's always gonna be there. It would have been difficult for me, for him to tell me to my face, because he, he knows I would have cried and we would have had to, to live through that pain. So it was almost easier and I was late that day because I had had a flat tire. And so when I was on my way to the game, um, I got get a call from Tim Harris, our, our team president, and he said, I, I, I answer the phone, I go, I know I'm late, I'm on my way, I'll be there soon. He's like, no, 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 don't come here. He goes, Magic just resigned. I'm like, what, wait, what? So I said, okay, you know, I'm near the office, I'll go to the office, you come here, let's figure out how we're gonna deal with this. 
Um, and do you try and get magic on the phone? No, 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 no. Because okay. I know once he makes up his mind, he makes up his yeah. mind. But I, in other words, had I been on time, mm -hmm. he probably would have had to tell me to my face. Mm -hmm. So he had mentally prepared to give his resignation to me. I wasn't there. The media was there. Mm -hmm. And that's that's when the story spills out. Yep. So like, I'm not upset it happened. It was just, it took me off guard. And then, you know, we, we had to let the coach go, Luke Walton, who, you know, had been a player for Phil and that I felt very close to. I mean, it, it, it was a lot, a lot of stuff going on. Phil Jackson, who's the Lakers' longtime coach, you were in a relationship with him, I think, for 17 years. Mm -hmm. On the, the Hulu doc front, what if anything that your brother Jim and GM Mitch said impacted your view on how they engaged Phil to come back? I am sure for him he's making the right decision. But for what I could see, it just, you know, I know <laughs> they made a mistake. <laughs> because your brother had come to you asking if you thought Phil would come back. You had said, reach out to Phil. They have the conversation. Phil's under the impression he has 48 hours to think about it, had some health stuff going on, consulted the doctors, decides he's going to come back. And before he can make that call, gets a call saying they hired uh, Mike. Do you think the decision was intended to be personal at the time? I felt like it was personal to me and, and, and I was embarrassed that Phil was treated that way by my family. You know, he didn't deserve that. And so uh, he was willing to come back and coach Pal and Kobe one more time and that, you know, we still had an opportunity because we had Kobe, because because we had Pal, that we would be able to, you know, bring the team back, go for another championship, and instead they chose to hire Mike D'Antoni, who is a great coach, but he wasn't the right coach for Dwight Howard and Pal Gasol, you know, that that he wanted a different kind of team. I wished we would have had the opportunity to see what would have happened if Phil had come back that third time. You said that period destroyed you. Um, I think you had come back to the office only to basically be asked to leave because of the just physical impact it was having on you. I was devastated and I couldn't stop crying. It was such a waste of opportunity. It still bothers you yeah, today? Yeah, it does. W what about it? You know, because we were, we had the talent to possibly win another championship. And, um, and that, that's what gets to you more than the, the personal stuff? Yeah, because, well, I mean, then maybe Kobe doesn't get hurt. Mm -hmm. You know, then Kobe could have played out his career the way it should have played out mm -hmm. instead of being, you know, kind of trying to come back from the Achilles and eventually retiring and, and, you know, with a, with a team that, you know, wasn't very good. What about the first conversation uh, with uh, Jimmy? Uh, I, don't think, I, I don't think I could, I, I don't think I spoke to him for a while after that. And, you know, and Phil, in, in some ways, like Phil was relieved, you know, like he really didn't want to have to go back to coaching. So your dad passed away. You have, you're essentially given final say uh, for the team. What's that process for you like going about determining kind of what your dad's final wishes were with regards to the Lakers? My dad had told me, you know, I expect you, Jeannie, if a change needs to be made, I expect you to do it because you will have the authority to do that. And how I looked at it was that the Jimmy didn't really um, take the time to understand where I was coming from running the business side of the operation. And that, you know, when we signed our new 25 year deal for 
for our broadcast partner. Their question to me was, you know, we know how the team has operated the last 25 years. Are you going to operate it the same way the next 25 years? Well, of course. That's what we do. We're Lakers basketball. Jim wasn't part of those meetings. Mitch wasn't part of those meetings. I had to convince them. I was the person held accountable for what they were doing, and yet they wouldn't give me an opportunity to give, you know, just kind of share with them, you know, my thoughts. You know, how are we going to price the tickets? What kind of team are we? going to deliver to our fans. And I kept getting this like, well, we're going to have a lot of cap space. And it's like, people don't buy tickets to cap space, right? How are you supposed to run your business when you don't know who's going to be on the team? And then, you know, we go into free agency and we ended up with Timothy Mozgov and Lou Aldang, who are great players. But we had, we'd been selling cap space for all these months, and now cap space is delivering players that you know maybe weren't on the top of aren't going to put asses in seats. Right? I mean, you know, so to speak, right? So it was really difficult to be on the business side of the operation and not know what you know what's coming next and then you know they had mike brown as coach and then they switched to Mac mike d'antoni and you can't turn over a coach every 18 months because you the roster can't reflect those that coach's style and it was too hard to read and that's how our fans felt they were like you know what is Laker basketball? Kobe and I know it's a, a tough subject, but he, he was somebody that did give you advice during this mm -hmm. period of transition with the front office transition as you were kind of deciding what to do with your brother and what to mm -hmm. uh, do with Mitch. Um, how about the best piece of advice you got during that time? It was about how you execute, right? And isn't that like so Kobe? It was like, have a plan know what you need to do leading up, know what you're going to do afterwards. It isn't an impulsive thing. You, you have to be serious and committed. You have to follow through. And um, that impacted you how? Oh, just, you know, I mean, it was like, it was like hearing my dad again, you know, and that, um, you know, he had faith in me. We had a, a, a really good relationship. He wanted to see the Lakers do well, but he was very much about, you know, if you're going to do it, do it right. I don't regret anything that happened. I mean, it, it was, you know, yeah, it was a little rocky and, you know, meaning that we, we made the change, magic came in. What did you learn about yourself? Um, when you're kind of fighting for your survival during that period? <laughs> Just, you have to have a small circle of people you trust and you have to do the work because there's no amount of hiring PR people to get people off your back. The, the only proof will come in wins and losses and to be the last team standing in 2020 in the bubble. Um, was a real testament to, you know, the team that that Rob had put together, and um, the sheer will of LeBron James, and you know what the NBA created by giving us a chance to finish out that season. You went through a six-week period where you lose your mom. NBA Commissioner David Stern passes away then Kobe and Gianna. How did that period affect you? You know, that it was January of 2020. Um, uh, we asked the league to give us one game, to postpone one, one of our games, because it was difficult to even think about coming back and playing basketball. But eventually we did come back and play, and LeBron, gave the most amazing speech 
I realized that that is how we're going to heal is like, you know, staying together and, you know, putting our energy into, into basketball. And then another few weeks, COVID hits and they shut it all down. And, and that left me reeling because I couldn't find comfort. I didn't know what to do. I didn't, I felt so lost and disconnected because we weren't allowed to be together. I cried many, many nights to sleep because I just, I lost so much and so many people that I could talk to and, and you know, turn to and, you know, and the one last thing we had, we, you know, we couldn't do. How did you get through that time just personally? I don't know if I'm ever going to get over it. You know, I don't. It, you know, it, it, it's just it's just continuing on this this path and, you know, um, staying strong and you know when my dad first bought the team you know his goal was to make the lakers the best team in the nba and you know winning in 2020 brought us number 17 and brought us even with the boston celtics and so when you ask me you know, what drives me in this business. And it's, it's really to continue w the legacy that Dr. Buss started. And if we could get that next championship, number 18, that's what keeps me going. Cause I can't think, I can't, the pain is still there and it still hurts. Kobe in some ways played a role in now having the uh, best, you know, player in the game here. Um, what was it about that conversation that he shared with you that, you know, I think it was a poolside bungalow near his Newport Beach home that uh, in a way influenced LeBron down the line deciding to come here? As Kobe, you know, would say, like, you know, the Lakers are the best and should have the best in the league. And if you can get LeBron to come and be a Laker, you got, you got a chance to win. I think the, the Laker greatness, you know, was something that LeBron appreciated. And, um, and, and sorting the front office stuff. Yeah. And, and um, you know, the idea that um, he is now the all-time scoring leader and that he did it wearing a Laker uniform means a lot to me. Uh, although it is, it's not a Laker record, it's a LeBron record and a, a testament to his longevity in this league. Um, but, you know, that was, that was uh, a really a highlight in this last season. And whether it's LeBron or Kobe, what have you learned over the years about how best to work with players of that caliber? When you have talent, you know, you, you make sure that that talent can thrive. So you do everything that you can. And, you know, his work ethic and what, what he does and how it inspires the rest of the team. It's like, it makes everybody's job so much easier because everybody wants to be part of this, you know, special thing that he's the leader of. Was there a part of Kobe's Hall of Fame induction ceremony that meant the most to you? Vanessa did the speech and, you know, her bravery and her class has been um, inspirational to me. Like, I would do anything for her because she's, she's lost more than anybody could even imagine. Um, so, and she was so beautiful and eloquent in her speech. And I know Kobe talked about going into the Hall of Fame. So, you know, they had those conversations. And certainly uh, 
you know, we were able to retire his jersey and, and having that celebration and retiring not only number eight, but also number 24 um, was really such a special thing to do. And I will always be grateful that we had the opportunity to celebrate Kobe the way we did, because Kobe came to me um, and had decided to retire, but he let me know in November. And he only, he only wanted to talk to me. He didn't want to tell the basketball side because he wanted to announce his retirement very specifically, and he didn't want it to leak out. And, and that's how Kobe was. He had like a vision for how he liked to do things. And he knew he could trust me, and he knew that I could accomplish what he wanted. It was like the third Sunday in November, and we were playing, I think, the Indiana Pacers. And everybody who was at that game, who was present at that game, got the letter. And those were the only people, like no other letters were printed. So if you had the letter, that, that was proof that you were there the night that he announced his retirement. So no one could say, oh, I was there. No, well then where's your letter? Because everybody who was in attendance got this letter. And you know, he always had such a great style. So um, we had a whole season to celebrate him. And what a gift that is. Right. That, um, you know, and I think even he was surprised at every, every city we went to, they celebrated him. Even the teams that hated him yeah, right. couldn't help but like celebrate, you know, Kobe's last game at the Garden. And, um, you know, it turned out to be something really special for such a, a dismal season. We weren't going to make the playoffs, you know. That led to that last game at Staples Center where, you know, he scored 60 points and the place went crazy and we made it Kobe night and we, it was, it was like a carnival. It was, you know, and, and I, I just take such comfort in knowing that he knew how much we loved him. You know, we, we never missed an opportunity to tell him that. Why historically have you been hesitant to get involved in like basketball personnel decisions when, you know, it seems like you're, I mean, literally as qualified as anybody based on your body of work? I don't get involved in the X's and O's. Um, I empower people that do understand the X's and O's. And if they're not, if I can't trust them, then, then they're not the right person for the job. And so, like, I, I can't deal with people who know something's coming down, you know, the street, and then they try to downplay it until it hits me in the face, right? Like, I want to hear, tell me the good, tell me the bad. Yeah. There's no reason to be afraid of me. We can work through any kind of issue as long as there's transparency and communication. And they know that ultimately I, I am accountable for everything that happens in this organization. I don't, you know, throw anybody under the bus. <laughs> so, you know, that I, um, you know, the hardest thing for me to, to be involved with is when we have to trade a player. But um, there are some front offices that would leak stories about why a certain player should be traded or that they're lazy or they're overweight so that they can take some of the heat off themselves when they do make that trade. We would never do that. We are always straightforward. We understand the rules of the game and you know that, that players can feel good about coming here and being part of something um, that they know they'll be supported. And you're also known for not nickel and diming players 
too. In, in fact, you're actually proud of, of them when you know they've earned the big contracts through you guys. There's um, somebody that's out there writing a book, and um, he said to me that I have a reputation of of um, running a bare bones organization. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute. Like, we've paid a luxury tax the last few years. Like, like how does that equate to how the Lakers operate, except that someone's trying to create a false narrative about, um, you know, um, I guess, me doing things on the cheap. If you want to call this bare bones organization, I like to think it, that we're efficient, that we don't have a lot of waste and uh, I'm not gonna spend needlessly. When the young players that were making no money like Austin Reeves and Rui Hachimura, when they got their deals, how ridiculously happy she was that these guys got what they were worth. There was no like, go back, go back and counter at a lower price. The business brain was completely overwhelmed by her character. And her character and her values was these guys are fantastic and integral to the success of the greater organization. And, she, and they're good people. And so her genuine joy that these guys got paid, it speaks to how beautiful a person she is. One of your top lieutenants, Tim Harris, once said, you use your authority in a responsible and cerebral way. <laughs> uh, what do you think that means? That means I don't panic and that you know any any problem can be solved it may not be easy but there's always a way to figure out what the next right step is in what ways can you be tough um, you know people not living up to their you know potential I can't stand wasted talent that seems like a crime to me so, you know, uh, people that are kind of uh, winging it, don't do their homework. I, I don't do well with that. How would you describe her work ethic? Tireless. It's not a job you punch out of. It's not like, fixed all the pipes. Now I'm gonna go home and have a beer on my deck. It's, no, it's the phone rings all the time, and I don't know if she ever can put her feet up and say, done with work for the day. So it's, it's, just, a, it's just a tireless work effort, and it's, it's a willingness to just be the buck stops there. You know, it's, you, you can only go so far up the ladder. I feel like she's, she's the top of the food chain there, and it's got to be exhausting. I am definitely a person that if you're going to do something, do it right, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, really throw yourself behind what, whatever it is that you're doing, be in the moment. I'm a horrible multitasker. So like, I'd rather do one thing really, really well and be completely satisfied than slice myself up and kind of get a C grade in a bunch of different things. Mm -hmm. That isn't satisfying to me. I'd much rather be completely focused and you know, pay all my attention and accomplish a goal. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you doing this.